Welcome everybody. It's an exciting moment for all of us. It's our first Diversio UK webinar. I'm very grateful for all of you for making the time to join me, Daniel Fellows, the General Manager of Diversio UK and EU, alongside the Director of Diversio EDU, Sakina Reid. We know that inclusive workplaces start with training and Diversio leads the way in providing industry-leading training for employees, HR, DNI practitioners uh, and teams globally. For those of you who might be meeting Diversio for the first time, Diversio is a people, culture, and inclusion analytics and training platform. Companies use Diversio to make critical business decisions powered by our ethical AI for the deepest understanding of any team covering DNI, people, culture, and also delivering world class training and educational programs. Launched in 2019 in Canada and now working in 51 countries globally. During our live and on demand webinar, uh, inclusive performance reviews, a path to fair and equitable feedback in the EU and EK. We'll cover lots of areas, but maybe four main areas to highlight. We'll look into insight into how unconscious bias impacts feedback, best practices for providing feedback, uh, development focused feedback, really important that piece, and strategies to ensure a fair and constructive reviews for all employees. And at the end, we'll have 10 or 15 minutes for any questions. We love questions, particularly difficult ones. Uh, which we'll, we'll go through uh, in the chat. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Dan Fellows. Uh, I recently joined Diversio in August. Um, my previous company, I was the founder and CEO of an artificial intelligence machine learning innovation company that built solutions to help people hire equitably. And previously, I was director of marketing at Indeed.com, uh, Microsoft and Vodafone, uh, and have a, a deep uh, passion helping people hire and helping people get the jobs and the careers that they want, not based on their, their gender, their race, their age, or their sexual orientation. And I'm delighted that Sakina has um, started work early today. Um, Sakina, over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, and thanks for that introduction. So as Daniel mentioned, Today, we're going to cover off a few areas um, where bias shows up in performance reviews, how to provide actionable um, developmental focused feedback, and a couple of other ways that you can weave fairness into your performance reviews. So I hope that whether you're just starting out or you're revi refining an existing system, that these insights will help you provide some actionable steps on your journey towards fairer and more effective performance evaluations. So I'm going to start with a dirty word right off the top. Meritocracy. Meritocracy is often seen as the hallmark of fairness. However, labeling an organization or labeling your own organization as a meritocracy can actually lead to some complacency around bias. And this belief creates a paradox. So when you claim to operate solely on merit, it may result in individuals ignoring or downplaying biases, and even the most well-intentioned systems can unintentionally allow bias to influence decisions if they're left unchecked. So I want to talk about three levels at which bias can infiltrate performance reviews. So at the institutional or organizational level, so this stems from the written and the unwritten rules the systems that create the frameworks for behavior within organizations. So biases can automatically get embedded within formal processes like hiring, promotion, and evaluations. And then also in less tangible culture that governs the day-to-day -day interactions of individuals. It can also infiltrate, infiltrate at the group level, and this occurs when there are collective assumptions and norms around marginalized or equity-deserving groups who do not conform to those norms that the group has established. Finally, we have that individual bias that each of us has, and this occurs when our personal stereotypes impact evaluations. 
So we all have subjective perceptions, but when we allow that to skew judgment, it can lead to unfair assessments based on unfounded assumptions about someone's capabilities or character. So the way bias shows up is often in the quality of the feedback provided. So we're going to talk a little bit later about what some studies have indicated, but it, they do show that women and people of color often receive vague or less actionable feedback, which limits their ability to grow professionally. So I'm going to offer you some strategies that will um, help you address bias at each of these different levels. I've got a separate screen over here. I keep referencing that, that allow you to address each of these different levels. And first, I'd like to start with the institutional framework. So to address institutional or organizational level biases, I'd like folks to consider conducting an employment systems review around performance management. So what a systems review does is it examines both the written and the unwritten rules um, of any employment system, exploring how the formal and informal norms interact to shape culture and employee experience and that overall feeling of inclusivity. So a systems review process involves analyzing the, the written policies and the procedures, as well as the practices, how it actually lives and breathes within the organization, alongside the underlying assumptions and behaviors that influence the decision making that goes on in an organization. So by highlighting how those elements promote or hinder fairness within the organization, the review can actually help, help you to identify areas for improvement and help organizations align their systems with their inclusion goals. So there are six main questions that will help you if you ever want to conduct a systems review to see if um, you can identify some barriers to inclusion. First of all, is your, and these can be applied to any employment system. Obviously today we're going to talk about it in the context of performance reviews. So is your process documented and transparent? I can't tell you the number of times I've done systems reviews with organizations and I start with the HR team and they're like, absolutely, it's beautifully written, it's communicated, it's up on the website. Nobody knows the individual staff, nobody knows where it is. Nobody knows where to find it. Nobody knows what it says. So how um, how the organization documents and communicates it is quite important. So that brings us to, is it accessible to all employees? It's helpful to have it posted, but you also have to tell people about it. Um, in the olden days, back when I was a girl starting out in HR, we had policy manuals. They were physical binders that lived on a shelf in the HR department. Um, not really accessible. Now with company intranets, it's a lot easier for organizations to get those tools out there to all people. Um, then we move on to uh, training and actual understanding of the system. So are all managers and employees regularly trained on the process? So one of the things I remember when I worked in a really large organization is we redeveloped our entire performance management system and we did a six-month entire company presentation in groups by department to everyone. And it's like, phew, done. And then we never did it again. And so anyone new that was hired never went through the training. We only rolled it out that one time. And it's only in retrospect now that I realize, wow, no wonder nobody understood the system. So is there regular training available on the processes, especially as people move from an individual contributor to a management level role? Uh, because while they may understand it in one context, there could be different things um, in the other context. Are your systems regularly reviewed for compliance with evolving legal and industry standards? 
There are a number of legislative changes pending in the UK, whether it's the UK Employment Rights Bill, it looks like you've got some changes over the next couple of years, the UK Equity Act amendments, um, those came into effect on the 26th, was it? So last week. Um, EU Directive on Pay Transparency and EU AI Act. So have any of you considered which of your existing employment systems may be impacted by these legislative changes? And do you have a mechanism to implement those changes and then communicate to managers, employees, how those systems are um, evolving? Is your performance review process consistently applied across the organization? So I can almost hear people saying, yeah, but that doesn't make sense because my sales team has like way different performance metrics than, for example, my HR team or my marketing team or my customer service team. Totally fair. It's fine to have different sort of processes to help align how different departments operate. But the bigger question here is, if you have a defined process, if you have a documented process that's acceptable, that's been trained, that you've trained everyone on, is there a mechanism that helps you identify if people aren't following the process? And if you discover that there is a manager who's not following the process as it's documented, are there consequences for that? So that's a, that's a pretty big consideration. Um, one area that a lot of people fail to recognize because you get a whole bunch of HR people in a group together trying to uh, implement a new system or process, does the policy or practice disproportionately impact any equity deserving group? Did you ask or seek input from the equity deserving groups within your organization? For example, uh, employee resource groups are great ways that you can fly uh, a new policy or process across some employees and get some feedback about how things you may not uh, know or have unintended consequences. Uh, you could use your diversity, equity, and inclusion councils or committees, any of those ways to try to seek some of those pieces of information. What is it that we haven't considered? Who wasn't involved in uh, making this policy or process? And finally, are there accommodations that could be considered and applied when needed? So ensuring that the process accounts for individual needs, whether for employees with disabilities, neurodiverse employees, or even um, caregiver responsibilities, anyone who requires adjustment, just making sure that everyone can participate equitably in the review process. So once you've looked at your systems, um, we want to look at how frequently we examine our systems because having implemented a full brand new um, up-to-date um, uh, performance management system previously, I know that this is a big, heavy lift. And because of that, these systems tend to live in an organization for a long time. They have a certain degree of longevity because nobody wants to tackle that beast again. It is a lot of work. And because of that, um, oftentimes you may have an over-reliance on older or outdated best practices in performance management, which may not effectively address today's diverse workforce needs. So when we look at traditional best practices in formal performance reviews, we think of that annual documented performance review. Oftentimes there's a rating or a ranking system that organizations used, uh, things like um, forced uh, hierarchy. There's a focus on evaluation. And oftentimes uh, there was 
some sort of discipline or dismissal that might come out of it. This is the one time when you might be able to get rid of that problem employee. And these approaches typically emphasized identification of weakness as opposed to fostering growth. And they can lead to a culture of fear and defensiveness among employees. In contrast, some of the more modern um, performance management practices emphasize things like continuous feedback and adaptability. So key elements include an ongoing alignment. So rather than having that one annual review, modern systems prioritize continuous alignment with organizational objectives, enabling timely feedback on performance. So if I look at um, my example in the past year, at the beginning of the year, I was with one company and we were purchased. So this resulted in a need for both organizations to shift their organizational priorities midway through the year. And that will have an impact on the performance management of the individuals within each of those organizations. So having regular reviews can ensure that you are adapting to the organizational ebbs and flows, shifts and needs. One of the other major key elements um, in modern performance management is around employee development. So rather than the punitive approach and the weakness approach, today's performance reviews focus more on supporting growth through feedback loops and encouraging continuous improvement as well as skills development. And this is helping organizations to retain top talent. Um, another key element is around psychological safety. So a number of these pieces really support psychological safety, fostering an environment where there are clear expectations, open two-way communication that encourages employees to take risks without fear of punitive repercussions. Finally, there is a degree of flexibility now where employees are allowed to figure out how they want to achieve the goals that align to the overall organization. And this is leading towards the uh, workplace empowerment trend. So to ensure that your systems are consistently reviewed and updated, we do recommend that you establish a formal review process However, this is not something that can easily be done by one person um, every year. So consider spacing it out over time. For example, you could have a two-year review cycle where every quarter you look at one employment system, and this allows you to space it out. It allows you to implement things, um, allows you to review things with a focus. And again, I highly recommend you use those employee resource groups to help get diverse perspectives. External organizations can also assist in this endeavor. So tackling the challenges of institutional and group bias may help increase the likelihood of Oh, sorry. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about moving from institutional to group level. So group bias can still arise from the way organizations, organizational values are defined. So frequently values such as collaboration or leadership are expressed in vague terms, which allows for subjective interpretations, which can then perpetuate bias. For instance, without a clear definition of collaboration, certain employees may be unfairly perceived as less collaborative due to personal biases. So to mitigate group biases, organizations should establish clear and objective definitions of these values and behaviors. So by specifying what effective collaboration entails, for example, uh, engages in joint problem-solving activities, offers constructive feedback, leverages team members' strengths to achieve project outcomes. For example, organizations can foster a more inclusive environment. 
So the clarity not only reduces subjectivity in performance evaluations, but also ensures that employees are assessed fairly regardless of their backgrounds. So in my experience conducting systems reviews, I have observed the significant effort that organizations invest in defining the performance metrics and behaviors necessary for employees to meet or exceed expectations. Because the result of these performance reviews, those decisions often lead to compensation adjustments and or promotions or um, succession planning. But these definitions are so subjective and and susceptible to broad interpretation that it leads to inconsistencies. And I want to ask, do any of these performance criteria sound familiar to folks? So teamwork works well with others. I've seen this in countless organizations. Adaptability is flexible and responds positively to change. Creativity ideates innovative solutions, but these aren't actionable. So what I want to do is look at some ways we might be able to revise these statements. So teamwork from works well with others, we could look at actively contributes to team goals by participating in team meetings and completing assigned tasks on time. So you have something that you can... um, objectively look at. So yes, participation can be still subjective, but it's a little bit more objective than works well with others. Adaptability. Here's some ways you could um, look at defining adaptability. Demonstrates willingness to adjust plans based on feedback, implements new processes with minimal disruption. Finally, creativity generates at least three alternatives for challenges, implements at least one innovative idea. So you don't have to copy these. These aren't the one best, but it just gives you an idea of how you can move from uh, a highly subjective to a slightly more objective definition. So tackling the challenges of these institutional and group biases may help increase the likelihood of inclusive performance reviews but it still leaves the biggest challenge of all, and that's individual bias. Both employees and managers bring a host of individual biases to the discussion. But first, I want to talk to you a little bit about some research that I found so interesting when I was um, preparing for today's webinar. So there were a few different... um, studies that I looked at. Textio has done a massive review of performance feedback, looking at tens of thousands of pieces of performance data. There's a great McKinsey and Lean In Women in the Workplace report from 2020 that I leaned on. And there were a couple that I looked at in the UK, uh, the Stonewall report, um, And it's just what I find so fascinating is the discrepancies between how certain groups receive feedback. So let's dive into this just a little bit. So 88% of women receive feedback based on personality traits, and that's compared to only 12% of women. So what do you think you can do with a personality trait-based feedback? How do you evolve as an employee and get better if people are talking to you about your personality? 76% of top achieving women, these are the women that organizations have identified as top achieving in their organizations. 76% receive negative feedback compared to just 2% of high achieving men in the same organizations. And then for every 1,000 words in performance reviews, women experience twice as many instances of poor quality critiques compared to men. So in this context, a poor quality critique refers to vague, unconstructive, or overly negative feedback that fails to provide actionable insights for improvement. 
So women, particularly those in leadership roles or traditionally male-dominated industries, often face those personal or character-based criticisms rather than evaluations based on their skills and contributions. So now I want to move over to uh, persons of color. 22% of women of color receive fewer than two performance evaluations a year. So if we look back at the trend moving from um, one annual performance review to more um more often regular feedback, often it's quarterly or monthly. So if you have your women of color receiving fewer than two performance evaluations compared to 12% of white women, that means 88% of white women are receiving more than two performance evaluations a year. Which do you think is getting better feedback in order to advance their careers? This disparity indicates that employees from racialized groups, which include Black and Latinx individuals, often don't even receive the necessary feedback to support any professional growth. Building on that report, the research that I mentioned conducted by Textio found that Black men receive nearly nine times more non-actionable feedback compared to white men under the age of 40. So this statistic underscores the challenges faced by some of the Black employees in obtaining useful insights from performance reviews that would allow them to advance their careers. Feedback, um, the Stonewall report that I referenced from 2018 indicates that 2SLGBTQ plus employees frequently encounter bias in performance evaluations as well, particularly in environments that lack some level of inclusion policies. So they report receiving vague feedback tied to stereotypes, such as being too flamboyant or needing to appear more professional. So this has an impact on both the individual and the organization. So for individuals, if you're not getting anything, how do you ever, how likely are you to receive promotions if you're not getting any feedback on how to better your performance? When you're not getting feedback, when you're feeling overlooked, when you're receiving vague or worse, biased feedback, it starts to erode individuals' self-esteem and their confidence in the professional abilities. And once you start losing self-esteem and confidence in your professional abilities, um, employees become less engaged and are more likely to completely disengage. And that has organizational impacts. So if you aren't receiving feedback and you're starting to feel um, a lack of confidence, you may be hesitant to take risks or think outside the box. And if individuals aren't feeling like their contributions are recognized or they're feeling judged unfairly, individuals are going to be less likely to engage in creative problem solving. And research indicates that environments lacking in the psychological safety to take risks um, result in reviews reduced innovation and stagnation, and that can have a serious business impact. Once you start becoming less engaged and you actively disengage, you're probably starting to look for another job. Gallup has found that disengaged employees are twice as likely to leave their jobs within a year compared to those receiving constructive feedback. Additionally, Turnover among women and racialized minorities tends to increase in environments where feedback is either inconsistent or biased. So what do you think the impact of high turnover is? <laughs> well, when you've got people who are disengaged, you probably have a lack of productivity and a lack of performance. And lack of productivity and performance leads to bottom line impacts. So if um, Harvard Business Review study found that employees lacking clear, actionable feedback are 23% less likely to meet their performance goals. 
So what's the impact on your organization if employees aren't meeting their performance goals? <clears throat> you end up with uh, lower employee morale and lower engagement, which as HR professionals, most of us know, have additional bottom line results. You have um, this directly links to customer satisfaction and can be linked to um, bottom line productivity. So those who feel they aren't being evaluated fairly or feel that they're overlooked for developmental opportunities are less likely to be motivated, leading to lower engagement. A McKinsey research indicates that employees perceive bias in performance evaluations are more likely to disengage, leading to that higher turnover or leading back to that lack of productivity and performance. Um, if your pipeline for leadership, if your succession pipeline is not being robustly filled by people who are receiving actionable feedback to improve their performance, you're gonna end up with a whole bunch of the same at the top. And we do know that if there's an imbalance in that pipeline, when people don't see themselves represented at the top, they don't feel like there's opportunities. So if you don't have women in the pipeline, you don't have equity deserving groups in your leadership pipeline, you're just gonna keep perpetuating that. And then it starts to play out in your organizational reputation. So I want you to consider that in today's competitive talent market, and I know that like Canada, the UK is facing mis, uh, an, a, a mismatch of available employees and skills required. And so in a competitive talent market, your employer branding is critical and employees are sharing their experiences in public forums like Glassdoor and LinkedIn. So organizations that have perceptions of bias or lack of inclusion are going could have an impact in their ability to recruit down the road, especially from diverse uh, backgrounds, which could result in a weaker talent pool over time. So now that we've scared you a little bit, let's look at some practical ways that you can move from the personality-based feedback that we talked about and I can't tell you the number of times I've had managers come to me with this type of uh, feedback. How do I tell this person how annoying they are? And let's focus on how we can turn <laughs> the... Oh, that was amazing, Kina. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't frame it like that, Daniel. Okay. It was more... No, sorry. Um... <laughs> You're just annoying. Yes. yes. <laughs> Um, it's so true though, when you're frustrated with an employee, mm. oftentimes we can use those you are statements because yeah. it's so simple and so direct, but they, and they have such an emotional impact. But if you're using those in your performance reviews, you're going to end up with defensive, um, employees and it makes it harder for individuals to actually hear whatever feedback you're giving them. Similarly, using superlatives like you always or you never can impact employees' perceptions of fairness. So even if you do nothing else, moving from you are and superlatives uh, to uh, to something a little less emotional could help create more inclusive environments. But if you want to move it to uh, even greater lengths, let's try to really define what's happening. So, Daniel, you are annoying. Um, really, In says Daniel. Years, so. I that a lot. Yeah. You interrupt people. I got to be honest, this one's me. Okay, this is my <laughs> feedback. So, I finally had someone who I who broke it down for me in a way that I could understand the impact that my behavior was having on the team at a larger level. And once I got past the, you're so annoying, it's like, mm, well, maybe to you, but everyone else loves me. So last week in this meeting, I heard you interrupt so-and-so. Now that disrupted the flow of the discussion. So how about you try allowing others to finish their thoughts before responding? And I'm like, okay, I can do that. That's that's something I can do. And I don't feel attacked 
anymore. I don't have that immediate response of, I'm not annoying, or I don't interrupt. It's, oh, you gave me a specific example. Okay, I I can see how that impacted that. Uh, you are disorganized. I have heard this a lot. I've got this employee, they're so disorganized. They miss deadlines all the time. Okay, so we're not going to focus on they are. We're going to focus on the missed deadlines. Last month, you missed a deadline and didn't complete X, Y, Z. Let's work together on a planning system that can help you keep track of tasks. So this is where we're going to work together to solution this. Um, finally, you are always late versus I've noticed that you have arrived late to this specific meeting multiple times. How do we fix that? On three occasions since date, you've arrived late four and then give the specific example. One other thing you could, excuse me, try to incorporate in going back to that systems review, accommodations. Would it help? I've noticed you're often late for this one thing. Would it help if we scheduled this thing at a different time that works better for you? Um, just understanding what's going on in employees' lives that can help. And it's like, oh yeah, I can only have this one time slot to drop my daughter at dance class and I'm always late getting back, whatever. Daycare, caregiver responsibilities, all of these things can impact how an employee shows up at work. So being a little accommodating can go a long way. So focusing on specific behaviors, using I statements, I noticed last week, I heard you interrupt, um, encouraging two-way dialogue, let's work together on a planning system, would it help if we scheduled this, suggesting alternatives, and um, the, the favorite thing, the hamburger feedback, balancing negative with positive. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the negative and positive when we get into employee biases. So when we move from vague to actionable, um, you need to be more assertive in the next client meeting. Take the lead on negotiation. So again, we're using, uh, we're offering suggestions and we're identifying clear actions. So it gives a specific task, clear instructions, and offers practical advice. Uh, you're doing well. Just keep it up. <laughs> There's nothing in that statement that's helpful. Um, so your presentation skills are solid. But next time, why don't you try incorporating more data to back up your points? So again, give specific example about what the employee did well, and then clear steps for improvement using data from a specific source. And this will help strengthen it. So I want to acknowledge that you did a great job. And if you want to take it to the next level, here's how. And then you're doing fine, but you could be more proactive. There's nothing there that you can really take away from that. So let's look at defining what proactive looks like in this role specifically. So for the next project, try to anticipate potential issues with the timeline by flagging delays as early as possible. So this gives the, um, this is how you can demonstrate being proactive in this uh, role and opens the door to discussing accommodations. Let's discuss tools or resources that you might need. So here's just a couple of ways that you can take some of that traditional vague um, feedback and try to make it a little bit more actionable. As I mentioned, every employee you meet with for their performance review is also going to bring all of their biases into the conversation. And here are a few that you could be aware of and a couple of ways that you could help mitigate that in your meetings. So I was talking about the hamburger feedback. Um, did you know that research shows employees are more likely to remember and internalize negative feedback over positive feedback due to negativity bias? This is the psychological phenomenon where negative experiences or comments have a greater impact on one's perception than positive ones. So Journal of Applied Psychology tells us that employees often fixate on the criticism, which can impact their self-esteem, and they bring that into their 
future performance reviews. So to mitigate this, one of the things you as a manager can do is focus on framing feedback constructively and balancing criticism with positive reinforcement to prevent employees from being disproportionately focusing on that negative. They also have the lens of um, confirmation bias, where if an employee has previously received negative reviews on a certain area of their personality or like the disorganized, for example, they expect that feedback and they expect it to be critical in often interpreting neutral or even positive comments through the negative lens of that previous um, feedback. The primacy effect is where that initial feedback um, becomes, carries more weight and plays a bigger role in how employees approach all subsequent reviews. And you can combat these two biases by being consistent in providing feedback throughout the year so that they don't have that one piece and then linking it to a next. You want to provide regular feedback and avoiding those generalizations like you always and you never. Okay. Um, finally, we have something called stereotype threat. This is where employees from marginalized groups, such as women or racialized individuals, um, a f they, they process feedback in a certain way. So individuals fear being judged or treated according to negative stereotypes about their groups. And a study in the American Psychological Association found that when employees anticipate biased or stereotyped feedback, they're less likely to view it as constructive. So to mitigate this, managers should be aware of their own biases, which we all need to work on. I do know that. And ensure that performance criteria is clear, specific, and grounded in those observable behaviors rather than those subjective traits. And this approach can help alleviate the effects of stereotype threat and create a more inclusive environment for receiving feedback. So just to wrap up this, you can set the stage by encouraging employees to approach feedback with a growth mindset, helping them understand that the feedback is a tool for their development and they can start viewing constructive criticism as an opportunity to grow rather than a personal attack. You want to do the feedback sandwich, balancing negative and positive, and help employees maintain confidence while still taking on areas for improvement. And then looking at feedback as a dialogue, not as a verdict. So shifting that mindset that a performance review is being as a one-sided evaluation. In our organization, we often talk about feedback as a gift that you give employees. So consider it as such. Um, when employee feels involved in the conversation, they're less likely to view feedback through the lens of past negative experiences. They're more likely to see it as constructive about future goals. So we're almost at the end. When you're faced with employees' biases, despite the best intentions, it often becomes hard to coach yourself through this situation. And that means it requires a degree of self-awareness, reflection, and some specific strategies to help you maintain a fair and balanced approach. We got to acknowledge that regardless of the fact that we know managers have biases, we know the groups have biases, we know the organization has biases, equally employees are going to bring theirs to the table. And it could be around the relationship between you and the employee, as well as the relationship to feedback in general. So just recognize that it's there and it's not something to take personally. Focus on keeping the review process objective and constructive. You can do that through focusing on facts and datas, minimizing the influence of subjective opinions and reinforcing feedback is based on facts. One of the biggest challenges for me, cultivating patience and empathy. 
Managers need to understand that empl why employees might be reacting as they are could have nothing to do with the you and them situation right there. Is it a past negative experience? Is it a stereotype threat? Is it a fear of being judged unfairly? Understanding that root can help guide a more compassionate, more coaching type conversation. Check out your communication style um, and ask for feedback from the employee on how they experience these conversations. Create an open dialogue that allows for adjustments to how you provide the feedback as well. Perhaps the employee would like to read it in advance of the meeting. Perhaps they'd like to have a conversation, receive something written and go away before they respond. Being asked to respond in the moment can be sometimes upsetting for employees. And then ensure that you're being consistent. So set those expectations, follow through and be consistent. So I hope that you've enjoyed what we've talked about today as I provided you with ways to address bias at three different levels, institutional by conducting systems reviews to ensure equitable processes at the group level, by implementing objective performance criteria, and on the individual level through training, self-reflection, and behavior-focused feedback. So this holistic approach not only fosters inclusion, but delivers measurable business outcomes from improved engagement to higher retention and productivity. So regardless of where you or your organization are on the journey towards greater inclusion, I hope today's presentation has given you at least one idea that you could take away and implement. Don't feel like you have to do it all at once. Just start small with one one small action that resonates and fits with what you're already doing and begin from there. Daniel, what do you think? Do we have any questions? I'm a bit overwhelmed. I'm a bit overwhelmed. It was <laughs> incredible. Absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. I think I've learned that much for a long time in terms of, in terms of what to do that, that vague to actionable and uh, subjective to objective, I think is, is critical, particularly with specific examples and I think you alluded to it many times, but maybe didn't say it. Uh, empathy, empathy is key. You know, we've all yeah. been an employee, we've all been we've all had line managers, we've all been managers, et cetera, et cetera. So empathy is um, yeah, critical to, to everything that we do because we're all human beings. We all want to belong. We want to have, you know, um, a place, a role. Um, we want to be part of a collective as well. Um, specific questions. Yeah, we might have we might have answered it, but let's go over it again. What's the best approach for addressing an employee who takes feedback personally rather than constructively due to conscious or unconscious bias. I think your your previous slide literally came up at the just at the right moment. I think the the five key elements you had there really really worked to help. Um, I think your what you said also about sending feedback in advance. Otherwise, it could be seen almost as confrontational as well. Giving specific examples, focusing on the facts, cultivating patience, which both struggle with um, obviously reflecting on our own communication style. Right. Something, something that's really worked for me is, is asking questions. Yeah. Is asking people, you know, a lot of people don't ask, they just expect, particularly with a hierarchical relationship. So asking questions. Um, and the second question was, uh, do you adapt your feedback approach or style based on cultural or individual differences? Wow. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, I think that's actually a, such a great question mm -hmm. because, yeah. you know, you can, when performance reviews always, don't always, but often feel like something in addition. It's like, oh my God, I've got all of this real work to do and now I've got to stop oh. and I've got to yeah. document all this stuff and I probably should have been doing it all year. But do I adapt? I certainly adapt or ask for feedback. Often for me, the learning has been do it before you provide the feedback, not after it goes off the rails. Um, so I have learned to ask, how do you like to receive? What yeah. format do you like? Um, I think COVID and 
the uh, distributed work, no longer being in an office or having that opportunity to sit and have body language that you can read really impacts the ability to give that feedback uh, in some ways. So I think that has been an adjustment as well. How about you, Daniel? What do you do around um, cultural differences? I think every single person that you're working with and collaborating with is different in, in every single way. So to think that you've got one single approach, um, that ultimately isn't going to, isn't going to land. It's not going to impact. Yeah. I think your, your point about asking how you like feedback, how often would you like feedback in what format, what work, what works for you? Because my yeah. role ultimately as your line manager is to make you successful and is to make you professionally, you know, uh, feeling motivated, sense of autonomy and also achieve what you want to do. So I'm, I'm a facilitator for your success. How can I help you? Yeah can help you do that as well um, because yeah everybody whether it's gender or race ethnicity sexual orientation age everyone's completely different so we can't have a blanket approach I know that's super hard if we've got any folks in enterprise businesses that have got a lot of people but I remember managing a team of 60 across 20 countries and <laughs> yeah. I didn't actually do any work that was my job I mean literally um, people management is a job yeah it really really is I was lucky to have a pretty awesome HR business partner that helped me but yeah if you're managing one individual if there's somebody in Greece or there's one in Italy and Paris then yeah it's it's very very different but I think you need to have a, a bespoke approach for each individual and also you love that a bespoke a, approach yeah your, your point was amazing literally oh, I've got to do their I've got to do the review next week and you've, yeah. you've had 11 months to do it or maybe three months or whatever the the cadence is uh personally I think quarterly is, is really really important because everything you do evolves so quickly everything yeah. changes the environment socially politically there's a lot of change in the world at the moment, which makes people uncomfortable and anxious. And I think it's important that they've always got an avenue uh, and a path to have that conversation with, with hopefully some of the work that, that they trust uh, is there to, there to help them. Awesome. All right. I think we're out of questions, um, mainly because you've covered it all, Sakina. I mean, I, I literally was typing questions and then you kept answering them as I went along. So again, thank you so, so much for doing this. Um, I've learned a huge amount. Hopefully the, the folks on the, um, on the webinar have as well um thank you all again for making the time i appreciate an hour what day is it a tuesday it is quite a lot to ask but hopefully you have learned more um if you'd like to join us for our next diversity webinar that's going to be by november the 21st with laura mcgee the founder and ceo of diversio where we're going to be digging into something really really new but incredibly important around compliance about how you ensure workplace safety by preventing sexual harassment in the workplace we know that new uk law went live uh, yesterday um, we'll send out the link for the next webinar tell your friends put it on social send it to your colleagues as well please please sign up if you're interested uh, and lastly but most importantly uh Arpuva, thank you so much for making this happen uh, we can do any of this without your support and guidance and, and, and brilliance so thank you again sakina thanks everybody attending um and yeah we'll see everybody soon <laughs>